Thank you all for uh, coming. Um, I won't speak lo long. I'm Esra Akjan. Uh, I'll just say a few words. Um, this panel is happening as part of two different series at Cornell. So I would like to name those series uh, and introduce Sasha, who has conceptualized and uh, convened this panel. And then Sasha will introduce the panel and the panelists. So will this robot take my job panel uh, is part of first Cornell Institute for European Studies migration series that was launched this term. This series aims to discuss the historical and contemporary relevance of migration. Uh, and we conceptualize migration not only as the migration of people, but also images, technologies, words, ideas, objects, information, and so on. So we hope to discuss themes such as academic freedom and exile, migration of images, automation, employment, and migration, migration of words, the immigrant continents, crossing the Mediterranean, and so on. And this series aims to approach migration from the perspective of multiple disciplines and to put those disciplines into conversation. So it is really very rare to see panels like this uh, that bring together <coughs> faculty from different engineering departments, science and technology, labor relations, and architecture. So I'm particularly excited about both the multidisciplinary aspect and the format uh, of this panel. Um, and second, this panel is also part of the Critically Now series uh, that was launched in spring 2017 by a group of faculty in the Department of Architecture as a bottom-up and growing set of events such as open classes, exhibitions, colloquiums, movie screenings, publications, seminar and studio collaborations, and so on. It was launched to respond to the current events such as the travel ban, immigration and statelessness, racialization, civil liberties, infrastructure projects, climate change, automation and employment, to name a few. And we want to discuss architecture's role and critical potential in these matters. So this series is expected to shape up and grow in time uh, with the participation of faculty, staff, and students. I should say that critically now is something like a tag. So if you are organizing an event that fits the scope and aspirations of this initiative, please let us know so that we can uh, collaborate. So about this panel, I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, the exciting statements and polemics um, to be presented on the relation between migration and automation, employment and technology, uh, whose conceptualization we owe to Sasha. Uh, so let me introduce Sasha very briefly. Uh, Sasha Zivkovic is an assistant professor at Cornell University where he teaches graduate and undergraduate design studios as well as seminar classes with a focus on digital fabrication computation and representation. He directs the Robotic Construction Laboratory, uh, which is an interdisciplinary research group investigating advanced materials and novel construction technology. Zhivkovic pursued his graduate studies at MIT, uh, and prior uh, to coming to the US, he studied architecture at Stuttgart University, where he was awarded a fellowship from the German National Academic Foundation. He is a co-principal with Leslie Locke of HANA, uh, which is an architecture practice based in the United States and Germany. HANA's research focuses on advancing traditional building construction techniques by implementing new technologies and processes of making, addressing subjects of rapid urbanization and mass customized housing design. In close collaboration with the high-tech building and industry, the office explores the implementation of advanced construction techniques such as additive manufacturing. So thank you, Sasha, for organizing. So thank you, Ezra, for, for this wonderful introduction and also your generous support of, of the event. I also want to thank all the Critically Now colleagues and student participants for making this series possible as well as I want to thank the Department of Architecture. So please let me introduce our speakers before then briefly introducing the topic and the format. Um, Guy Hoffman joins us from Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. Guy Hoffman is an assistant professor and the Mills Family Faculty Fellow in the Sibley School of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at Cornell University. Prior to that, he was an assistant professor at IDC Herzliya and co-director of the IDC Media Lab, Media Innovation Lab. Hoffman holds a PhD from MIT in the field of human-robot interaction, HRI, and a Master of Science in Computer Science from Tel Aviv University. 
He also studied animation at Parsons School of Design in New York City. Hoffman heads the Human Robot Collaboration and Companionship HRC Square Group, studying the algorithms, interactions, schema, and designs enabling close interactions between people and personal robots in the workplace and at home. His research interests include human robot collaboration and companionship, embodied cognition for social robots, anticipation and timing in HRI and multi agent MDPs, nonverbal behavior in HRI, robotics for the performing arts, and non anthropomorphic robot design. Ronald, so welcome, welcome guy to AAP. Um, and uh, the next speaker is Ronald Klein from the Department of Science and Technology Studies um, over there. Ronald Klein is the Sue and Harry Beauvais Junior Professor in History and Ethics of Engineering. Professor Klein's current research areas are the history of cybernetics and digitalization. He is the author of numerous, numerous articles on the history of engineering, industrial research, technology, and rural life, and information science and technology, as well as engineering ethics. The author of three books, Steinmetz, Engineer and Socialist in 1992, Consumers in the Country, Technology and Social Change in Rural America in 2000, and The Cybernetics Moment, or why we call our age the information age uh, in 2015, all published by Hopkins University Press. Professor Klein is now writing a book on the history of digitalization in the Cold War. He is past president of the Society for the History of Technology and the IEEE Society for the Social Implications of Technology and directs the Beauvais Program in History and Engineering Ethics at the Col College of Engineering. Well, welcome, welcome Ron to, to AAP. And then we have Ross Knapper, um, who joins us from the Department of Computer Science. Ross A. Knapper is an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science at Cornell University. His research focuses on the theory, algorithms, and mechanisms of automated assembly and human-robot collaboration. Previously, Ross was a research scientist in the distributed robotics lab at MIT. Ross received his MS and PhD degrees in robotics from Car Carnegie Mellon University in 2007 and 2011. Before his graduate education, Ross worked in industry at Compaq, where he designed high-performance algorithms for scalable multiprocessor systems, and also in commercialization at the National Robotics Engineering Center, where he adapted robotics technologies for customers in government and industry. Well, welcome, Ross, to AAP. Then we have Adam Seth Litwin from the School of Industrial and Labor Relations. Adam Seth Litwin is Associate Professor of Industrial and Labor Relations at Cornell's ILR School. Litwin's research, anchored in industrial relations, examines the determinants and impact of labor relations structures and technological change. His doctoral dissertation, completed at the Sloan School of Management at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, focused specifically on employment relations and information technology in the healthcare industry. He has published a mix of empirical and conceptual studies intersecting the areas of labor relations and technological change in both industrial relations and medical journals. At Cornell, he teaches undergraduate and graduate core courses in labor relations as well as electives focused on the evol evolution and impact of technological change on workers, organizations, and society at large. Welcome, Ross, to AAP. And last but not least, Kirsten Peterson, Peterson, Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Kirsten Peterson is an assistant professor of electrical and computer engineering She's interested in design and coordination of buyer-inspired robot collectives and studies of their natural counterparts, especially in relation to construction. Her thesis work on a termite-inspired robot construction team was featured in and on the cover of Science and was ranked among the journal's top 10 scientific breakthroughs of 2014. 
Kirsten did her postdoctoral work with director Metin City at the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems 2014 to 16 and became a fellow with the Max Planck ETH Center for Learning Systems in 2015. Her thesis was completed in 2014 with Professor Radhika Nagpal at Harvard University and the Weiss Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering. She completed a master's degree in computer systems engineering at the University of South Denmark in 2008 and a bachelor in electro electrotechnical engineering with Odense University College in Engineering in 2005. So, Welcome, Kirsten, to AAP. Let's give a round of applause to our speakers. I am, I am very excited that you all generously agreed to participate in this event. Um, it's, a, it's an amazing range uh, of, of colleagues here. And now I want to briefly talk about uh, the colloquium topic, and then, I'll, then we'll move over to the polemics. Um, this, I would like to welcome you to this colloquium with the somewhat dramatic and existential title, Will This Robot Take My Job? I admittedly had an identity crisis when RCL's giant KUKA, pictured here, arrived last semester. It stole my position of being the tallest person at AAP. <laughs> so I thought that's a relevant topic to discuss. Um, with the advancement of computation and robotic, robotics comes the potential for ever increasing degrees of automation in all sectors of life and economy. Developments in self-driving cars and trucks, self-aware grocery stores, self-assembling buildings, fully automated assembly lines, automated legal representation, automated care for the elderly, and especially artificial intelligence have the potential to drastically impact society at a global scale. What are the possibilities and dangers of automation? What are potentially new forms of human-robot cohabitation? What are the new economic models? Does automation cause job loss? What are possible political consequences? Recently, anxieties over the issue of migration and hostility towards immigrants seem partly related to issues of automation and fears of unemployment. The panel will address the relation between migration and technology, uh, among other things, and discuss how to collaborate across disciplines to better navigate the significant paradigm shift towards an automated society. Our format today is the following. Each speaker will present a polemic for two minutes, followed by a moderated discussion, and then a discussion with the audience. So we need your participation in this. And we'll do the polemics in alphabetical order, and we'll start with Guy Hoffman, then Ron, then Ross, then Adam, then Kirsten, then myself. So, uh, Guy, you have your two minutes. Um, hi, thanks for joining us. Thanks for the invitation, um, for having us here. Uh, as a roboticist, I'm always a little bit, um, especially surrounded by this esteemed uh, group here, I always feel um, out of place when people ask me about robots and jobs and about the future because these are two things I know very little about. I actually have no information about the future, um, even though I deal with robotics. Uh, the future is uh, unknown to me as well. Um, however, uh, through having been asked many times about robots and job loss, I've had to think about this many times, and this might be somewhat of an expertise that I've gained over the last few years because um, I have I've given this, uh, this a, a quite a lot of thought. And I want to put one idea out, which is the, my disbelief in the inevitability of these prognoses. I, I believe that we, my main message here is that we have political and social power to design the future that we have with robots, and it's not uh, a storm that we have to watch come towards us and analyze. Um, I, I'd like to tell two stories in this regard. One of them uh, I heard recently and might be a myth, but myths also have, uh, have their value. It's about a, um, a harbor 
in, in Europe and the Netherlands, uh, which decided for efficiency reasons to replace uh, many of the labor with, uh, with uh, uh, machines. And this was inevitable in terms of perhaps the economic uh, pressures, uh, but the way that the, that the management decided to do this, and again, I don't know if this is a true story, but I think it's a valuable story, is to um, decrease hiring, but not uh, do like a, a large one moment re restructuring of the labor force. Uh, older employees were um, asked to stay uh, until they retired, and slowly the workforce shifted within this one, comp this one harbor, which decided to instead of create a shock for their workforce, uh, create sort of like a slow gradient uh, change. Uh, the second um, point I would like to make about inevitability is that the question that comes up a lot is, is, is this moment uh, in history, is it uh, going to be like the Industrial Revolution, we're going to all <coughs> just figure it out, or is it, is it in a way qualitatively different, and, um, and we, we see all these jobs disappear, and we kind of can't imagine where the new jobs come from, but <coughs> this makes me often think that when we think about the jobs today, they will almost be unimaginable 20 and definitely 40 years ago. Uh, even 20 years ago when I was in university, nobody would, would think that anybody would get paid to manage a social media website because social media was not a thing and websites were barely a thing. Um, and 20 years before this, uh, convincing somebody that they would make a good living from programming computers, and it's not just a few random people, but a lot of people make a good living, was unimaginable. So I really believe in the unimaginability of the future labor market uh, in, a, in a way that uh, gives the power back to us to design this future and not just to observe and worry about it. Thank All right, thank you, Guy. Um, three minutes, 19 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, um, Ron, I can, you can stay there and I can put your slides up. Sure, um, sure, okay. I like this idea about a polemic. Uh, two minutes, here goes. I don't think technology is the most important part of this debate. And I think what's it, for me, as a historian of technology, what's important is to understand it as a latest round, and it kind of relates to what you said, the latest round of this debate about technological unemployment. So take the first slide. Yeah. Trying. This will, this will make it take longer than two minutes, and I shouldn't be penalized because of the machine I'll, I'll, here. I'll, uh, do, we, do we have some of the tech people here? This worked before. <laughs> it's not. It's not reacting. <laughs> oh well. I don't know. What it does. I, I can describe these slides. Uh, you want. Okay. The term technological un unemployment in English is coined in 1933 during the debate over. This term? Aha. Sorry. Aha, there we go. So this term technological unemployment c comes into use in English over a debate during the Great Depression in the United States. And this is from a Technocrats magazine. This was a group that believed that they could solve the crisis of 25% unemployment in the United States, oftentimes which blamed on the machine, oftentimes it blamed on automatic machines and factories. So this is the cover of the Technocratic magazine in 1933, and you see this evil robot uh, pulling up people, throwing away people out of jobs. And on the right is the robot has been tamed. How has the robot been tamed? It's been tamed through politics and economics, through throwing out the old capitalist system and replacing it with a new price system where they don't use money. It's based on ergs, how much energy it takes to make something. So this is the proposal during this big debate about technological unemployment in the 1933. How about the next one? Yeah. Okay. After World War II, the word automation is coined after World War II. It's coined in the 1950s. There's a little debate about who coined it uh, in the 1920s. Cybernetics, which I've studied, uh, one of the founders, Norbert Wiener, in his book on cybernetics, which is about control and communication, both in animals and machines, how they relate to each other, and it sometimes was called the science of robots at the time. And in that book, he said, I, I helped create the science, but after World War II, when, when scientists created atomic bombs and the horrors of, of uh, 
concentration camps on atomic bombs. I'm going to warn you about the dangers of my invention. And he warned about the dangers of automatic factories. And so when he's interviewed like that, I don't know if you can hard to see, but it says robots will take the jobs. Here he is. He's sitting at a very large computer at Harvard. Over on the right shows from Time magazine that this debate, after 15 years or so, is more ambivalent. Like all the newspaper coverage of cybernetics takes up the, the point about automation will automate it. Because there's a concern after World War II in the US whether the country will fall back into a recession, whether we're going to go back to all this new technology uh, losing jobs. So over on the right is a cover of Time, of Time magazine, 1965. And again, uh, this robotic trope, of course, comes from science fiction, comes from the RUR play in the 1920s, and it comes from science fiction. And it can be evil robots, and it can be good robots. And here's one, it's a little ambivalent image. In fact, if you read the article, that's exactly what the article is about. Computers are either good or bad, they can do bad things, they can cause good things, they can throw us out of work, they can make us work harder, and so forth and so on. So the last slide. So here's my point, or trying to argue, that we should think, or I should think when I'm doing this about this question, will robots take the jobs? As the last, this current round of this debate. And the debate involves a context, historical context, a place and time. We live right now in a historical context. Most people in the past, like you said, cannot predict the future very well at all either. And so what do we consider? We consider politics, economics, social, social aspects, cultural aspects, and the technology. Now by saying this, I realize sometimes when I give a talk like this, people say, well, we muddled through in the past. Look at those old pictures of those robots. We muddled through in the past. People got jobs, there were new jobs. And we'll just muddle through again. That's not my argument either. Because I don't know if we're going to muddle, muddle through again. I mean, look at climate change. We don't know if we're going to muddle through that either. So the, question, the point is not that we'll muddle through this again. But the debate, I think, should be looking at this broader context. And I, I, I'm glad to see that the panel is addressing that. How do I do as far as time? Thank, thank you. Thank okay. you. Um, and the next is Ross. Yes. All right. Thanks, everyone, for having me here. I'm really excited to talk to you today. Um, and that was a perfect setup following one technologist and one historian. Uh, I'm a technologist myself, although I'm also a, a student of history. I have a bachelor's in social history. So um, I can speculate a little bit about that aspect. Um, and the trends in the past tell us a few things. Firstly, we know that through past technological upheavals, there's been jobs lost that we don't miss nowadays for the most part, uh, and many new jobs created, uh, as we've heard about. And if you look in the popular press today, there's a lot of scary stories about how one third of current jobs might be automatable within the next several decades. Um, and the question, the big question is what new jobs might come into place to replace them? Um, and if we look at what are the differences between those new jobs and the old jobs that they replaced, there's another trend that we'll notice, which is that the new jobs oftentimes require a higher level of educational attainment. So it used to be there was an expectation that you could get a good job right out of high school. Uh, no additional training was required. Um, nowadays, even an associate's or even a bachelor's is not enough sometimes. Um, there's so many technology jobs that require a master's or even a PhD uh, because the complexity of the technologies involved has been increasing over the past centuries. And so there's a trend that I've recognized here, which is that there has to be a limit to this process. We cannot keep increasing the educational attainment levels forever and expect everybody in America or in the world to have a PhD in technology in order to operate all of these systems when they break, when they need to be reprogrammed to, to build them, to maintain them. So I think that this is gonna have to give way somehow. And there's already evidence of this problem cropping up. During the recent bad economy, um, while we saw that uh, there was huge unemployment, there was also, also a lot of uh, scarcity in a certain type of jobs. Companies were reporting hundreds of thousands of IT jobs going unfilled in the height of the bad economy. Uh, 
Um, and this seems contradictory, and it, I think it really has to do with the, the preparation differences between the available people uh, and the jobs that need to be filled. And I think that the answer in the end has to come back to the technologists, that we need to do a better job designing technologies that help you do what the technology needs. Um, so Guy and I work on human-robot interaction, and a lot of that is about communicating effectively in the language that ordinary people understand, using natural language, using gesture, understanding uh, social conventions and those kinds of things. And I think a lot more of that needs to go into technologies so that somebody like my mother would be able to use it um, without a manual, you know, without needing to call me to ask for help. So that's, I think that's what needs to happen, and I don't know how we get there, but that's, that's my prognostication. Thank, thank you very much. Um, next is Adam. Thanks, Sasha, and thank you all for welcoming all of us here. Uh, so, will this robot take my job? I say no. When, it, when is the last time you saw a social scientist speak that unambiguously? Uh, and there are two pathways by which I get there. The first is sort of trivial, but it's suggested by history, uh, and it's the one that economists conventionally speak of, which is the idea that technological advances create as many opportunities as they destroy, uh, they make goods cheaper, of higher quality, and they make jobs a lot cleaner and safer and a lot more interesting. The problem, though, with that line of thought is that it tends to look at what I think of as aggregates. It looks at wages and employment, and it does so in the long run. And you know what Keynes said about the long run, where we all end up, right? But um, it doesn't really consider distributional realities at all. So um, for for less skilled workers in the immediate term, the, the consequences of recent technological change are, at best, uh, probably bad. Um, and at worst, disastrous. And I would say, um, even worse than that, they're persistent. In other words, there's nothing that would get lower skilled workers out of that state. Uh, but even still, I would, I would still answer the question as no, that this robot will not take my job or yours. Um, and here's why. Until recently, Robots could only do exactly what we told them to do. That's no longer true, right? Now with artificial intelligence and machine learning, that's starting to change. But um, even today, um, we're in charge, right? The robots work for us. Um, and so um, here's why this matters, because uh, thanks to the work of a lot of our colleagues here at Cornell and some great scholars elsewhere, um, we know that robots or, or automation, we know what they do well. We have a sense of what robots or what automation is going to do well in the future. Uh, and so what happens is most analyses tend to break jobs down into their constituent tasks and then ask the question, okay, well, what's going to be left for humans to do? But then that leads me back to where I was. Who decides how these jobs are going to be unbundled? How many workers are going to be employed in them? How these workers are going to be rewarded for that work? Who makes those decisions? And it turns out that managers make those decisions, and they do so in the context of labor and product markets whose competitive rules are shaped by policy and norms and the other institutions that we create. And so if we do nothing, will this robot take your job? Yeah, probably. Um, but in fact, that might be the less alarming possibility because the alternative is that automation is going to allow your job to get decomposed into its constituent tasks, and then the robot's ability to take on many of those tasks that were once bundled into your job um, suggests there are going to be lots of people that are vying for a smaller and smaller number of jobs with the expected consequences for unemployment and for wages. But again, we can be proactive as human beings and as citizens, and we can actually engage our policymakers, and we can actually teach um, aspiring designers and engineers and managers, um, that they have agency. And if we can do that, then the no answer to, that I gave to that focal question, will this robot take my job, it actually can take on a lot more certainty because um, your job, under the right conditions, it may still look a lot like the one that you had and enjoyed, um, only it will have evolved to be a lot more interesting and more rewarding, both in economic terms and in psychic terms. And ideally, if we make the right decisions, and we remember that we have the agency, um, ideally there'll be more jobs like the one you have and like the one you like, uh, and in fact, there'll be even more people that are qualified to fill jobs just like that. Thank you. 
Thank you, um, Adam. And uh, let's let's move on to Kirsten. Okay. Uh, everyone hear me okay? Yeah. All right. So uh, thank you for inviting me here. Um, I have to try to remember what's on my slide because I can't see them. So $1,162 billion, more than a trillion dollars that go into the construction industry today. I'm not going to talk about robotics in general. I'm going to talk about my area because I feel like it would appeal to most of the architects in the room. Um, that's a sizable number, right? That's a, a field that is ripe for automation. And I am a roboticist, um, so if you could go to the next slide. Um, I'm going to try to motivate this field and why we should do automation with more than just money. Right? So if you look up in the upper left corner, if we had robots building, then we could start building in novel settings where it would be difficult or dangerous for humans to build. Right? That could be something like sending robots along to Mars, have them build a habitat, and then send people along after it. Or it could be something like building an oil rig in the middle of the ocean, or uh, building on the cold poles, or something like that. Um, it's a dangerous topic, right? It's a dangerous area. So on average, uh, every year, more than 20% of all work-related injuries are reported from the construction sector. More than two people, this is in the US alone, uh, more than two people a day are fatally injured on US construction sites. It's a pretty sizable number, right? It's not a great place for people to be. Um, we are experiencing a huge generational gap, right? In the 1800s, about 3% of all human beings lived in cities. In, in 1950, we were up to 30%. Um, you know, now we're more at like 54%, and most of this development is happening in developing countries, right? So there's a rapid influx to the cities, and we need to think about more sustainable and maintainable ways of building our cities. Um, ah, and finally, uh, according to the UN Habitat, there's currently 1.6 billion people in the world that lack ad adequate housing. And every year we add to that number with about 6 million refugees that flee their homes from uh, reasons of famine, war, political instability, right? Really the need for you know, very sustainable, efficient, safe, much cheaper and inexpensive construction has never been greater. And uh, if you go to the next slide, that's what I and a lot of other researchers and commercial vendors do. Uh, so up in the upper left corner here, I chose a local example, right? So this is up in Rochester, New York, where they build a semi-automated mason that can build walls about 10 times faster than a normal mason. Um, underneath, uh, there's a lot of hype right now about 3D printing houses, right? It works really well. It came out of USC originally, but now it's pretty much everywhere. I take a little bit of a different approach, um, as has I said. Right, so we do bio-inspired robots that can actually expand the structures from sort of uh, starting from a little footprint and then expand them out. Uh, the biggest we've shown so far is uh, an autonomous robot collective building a structure about 18 times their own volume, so pretty sizable. Um, so, you know, I think we're, we're doing a lot more to try to automate construction, and I'm going to answer the question of will this robot take my job differently from the rest of my panel, because that makes the discussion more fun. <laughs> yeah, I think it will. And I think that's okay. I think maybe actually as a society, we need to accept that there's gonna be a net loss of jobs and that is okay. Maybe we're not supposed to work eight or 10 hours every day. Maybe we all need to accept that it should be like six or four hours per day. And if that becomes the new stand, right, the new norm, then that's okay. Maybe we actually move towards a world where robots do more, we can gain more from less. That's what we're trying to work on. Right. Thank you. So I have I have someone in the same team. Uh, my my answer is also yes, um, and I'll will start with this image uh, of Constant, um, who designed New Babylon between 1959 and 74, uh, based on the following premise. Constant imagined a society of total automation, in which the need to work is replaced with a nomadic life of creative play. His polemic was that in the future, we don't have to work, and therefore we will live very different lives and construct very different cities. We become homo ludens, nomadic women and men of play, migrating on a global scale. And Constant was a situationist, challenging fundamental societal principles, critiquing 20th century capitalism, urbanism, and architecture at that time. And so since I first encountered New Babylon, I've been fascinated by the alternate reality it creates and suggests. So I say the robot will take our jobs and that will be liberating. Let's build a utopian society 
and let's play. So, um, I'm, I'm going to start, I think, with Ron's question. And when looking at the history of technology and various debates of the past, the mechanization of agriculture, the personal computer, um, what has changed? Or how is today's debate different than similar debates before? One thing that bothers me about these utopian predictions is that they do have it right that you need to change the politics, the whole political system to do it. They do have it right that you need to change the whole political system to do it. And I don't see any proposals for that. I see proposals, you should build better robots, right? So um, my, my, con my concern is this, uh, and I don't want to make this argument about utopian beliefs, because I can mention several four-hour day plans. Even the first person I wrote a book on uh, planned for that. It's usually based on technological determinism. It's usually based on the fact that if we have a right, good technology, it'll create such abundance, and that people will have leisure. That's that's an old trope in utopian belief. That could happen if you had a different political and economic system than we have at present, right? So that, that would be my answer, that uh, that's, what you, that's what I mean, but you have to consider the politics and, and economics of the present, because building more robots, it won't change the political system, I would say. It's not gonna change the economic system, building better robots. I guess I, I would also add, I, I don't think it would change um, the nature of human um, in, in, instatiability, is that the word I want? Um, it's very difficult to really ever satisfy humans' demands <laughs> for things. Luckily, actually, because that's one reason why, um, you know, if we look at farming, for example, at one point in time, farming was about 40% of U.S. employment, now it's down to 2%. And it's not because we're eating less, right? Um, people got a lot more productive and people found other things that they could actually demand that they would want. And so um, I think that might be a real issue with kind of this utopian perspective or even, again, Keynes said at one point in time we'd be working you know, 15 hours a week. Uh, and that might be true if we weren't so insatiable, right? Um, but I, I think, uh, I could get this wrong, but I think it was um, Thorsten Veblen that said invention is the mother of necessity, right? So try to explain to any one of us, even 25 years ago, that you'd want an iPhone and you'd say, for what? Why do I want to carry another thing around, right? But now every one of us wants the next iPhone as soon as we hear it hang out, right? So um, reflecting on uh, American cultural values, I think many of us really identify ourselves by what we do, by our work. Those of us who are fortunate enough to have a job that we really love, that we look forward to going to every day, um, would hate to give it up to a robot. But even those who maybe don't like their job, they still identify by it. You know, Even if you're working in a factory doing some uh, mundane thing, that still is an integral part of who you are. And I think that it's very hard to pull Americans in particular away from that. Um, and without saying anything about our, our two European panelists in particular, I did notice that <laughs> yes, <yeah. laughs> Euro European cultural values would have us working less and enjoying life more, so. <laughs> um, well, it, Kirsten, oh, please. Okay, um, yeah, so I, I guess you're right. Um, I think people still need things to do. They can't all go home and, and play video games every day. They probably could, but it, it wouldn't be helpful, right? Um, I do think there needs to be a change of mind in society, right? And it needs to be much more, there are soft jobs that it is hard for robots to do. And I'm sure Guy would argue with me here, but I think things like child raising and uh, things that robots are not well equipped to do, right? If we start uh, giving more value to those jobs, right? That also means that people would spend more time doing those things, right? And, and we'd probably be better for it. Since, uh so I will argue with you about this, <laughs> as you predicted. I, th I actually think that uh, child raising is going to be a great job for robots, um, <laughs> as as uh, as well education, and and I, and I actually think the soft jobs are 
that's getting easier and easier um, because our expectation there's, there's, there's sort of like a, a dual trend happening. People are excited about AI, about these chatbots that are just they, they, just, uh, they feel like they're really humans, you know, the whole Turing testing. But it's also because we're kind of becoming flatter in the way we, we, we talk, right? So humans and robots are kind of m meeting each other in the middle in a way that we are becoming more and more predictable and robotic. And uh, um, you can kind of guess what a person is going to say, like the LOL at the right time. And then suddenly, like, oh, the robot sounds just like a human. But humans also just became a little bit more robotic. So I, th so I think as our as our, for example, education and childcare system is becoming more and more and more structured, and you know, at age three, you already have to have your APs in line. Then robots will also be more in, more in a good position to be better educators than humans. So there's this duality. Well, following up uh, on something that Kirsten mentioned, the, the idea of reducing um, the hours of work uh, that we week that we work each week. Sorry, um, there are currently proposals also again in, in Europe about uh, introducing a universal income for all citizens, for all, all people um, in, in these countries uh, to discuss or, or mitigate some of the impacts uh, of increased automation. Uh, I wonder if you can share your, your thoughts on, on that as a, as a political framework uh, addressing Ron's uh, question of you know, what do we do is there anything that at the larger political scale that we change in order to accommodate this paradigm shift? Um, so the, the guaranteed basic income, I think, politically is a very hard sell. Uh, but I can comment on it technologically, which is that the idea of, of it is that we all have innate worth and that if you're relieved of the burden of, of working for health care, for food on your table, and for housing, you'll find useful things to do, right? And I, I think that's sort of the ideal, is that we'll all find something better than just playing video games. Um, and the big challenge here, one big challenge, is actually how do we find useful things to do that, uh, that are good pursuits of our time? And I think, actually, this is where technology can come to the rescue, is that there's some, some efforts now uh, looking at clearing houses of, of sort of um, you know, one-off work, sort of the, the Etsy model of, you make your own thing in your home, or the, the Uber model of you know a ride on demand. So um, it could be in the future if we had a guaranteed basic income, maybe we'd all find ways to still you know work even if it's not for money, um, helping people out. Right? You know, just staying home with someone's kid can be a very socializing thing, even even if you're not changing diapers. Do uh, you guys all roughly know what the universal <laughs> basic income idea is? Okay, good. Um, so uh, let, me, let me say, I definitely applaud the experimentation. I'm really glad to see that more and more places are trying it in somewhat controlled settings to see whether or not it works and what its labor market impact is. Um, so in that sense, I'm really glad to see people thinking very openly about it. Um, I, I have one problem. I have, I have sort of two problems with it. One is with the experimentation itself. Usually when you see them experimenting with this in Europe or now um, in Canada, they're doing this in and around Toronto. Um, the problem is that the results are not at all generalizable, um, in part because the money that they're providing is not universal, right? It doesn't go to everyone, which actually makes a, a big difference whether everybody's getting it or just select people. Uh, and also, it's not basic in the sense that it tends to be such a small amount of money that it isn't really enough to know if it's, um, it isn't really enough that one could actually sustain themselves, quit their job, and then decide whether or not they want to start a business or do something more creative than that. So, uh, so one set of issues I have is with the experiments themselves. I'm not going to be sure what to make of the results once they have them. Um, the other bit is that I think it focuses really narrowly on the economic reasons why we work. But you know, there are lots of reasons why we work, and Ross touched on this. I mean, you know, don't tell our deans, but I think a lot of us would probably work for nothing if we had, you know, <laughs> if, as long as we had a universal basic income, right? Like we love our jobs. Um, and so uh, I think for many of us, jobs provide something um, sociological and something psychic. And it doesn't seem to me that the universal basic income fully deals with that, with that reality. It seems to me like it's very focused on the, the economic exigencies of employment. So, the union 
my talk, I said technology was not the most important thing. Well, I don't think politics is the most important thing either. I don't think any of these things, politics on, by itself, economics by itself, technology by itself, right? We shouldn't be focusing on one magic bullet to this thing, right? I know it, this is usually something uh, my students do not like to hear when I say it's complicated, right? <laughs> things are interconnected, right? Right, I can't change the, Right, for example, we've been talking most about the U.S. and Europe. Well, uh, I was a graduate, former graduate student who studied uh, manufactured laptops in Taiwan, and then when they moved their, when they moved their factories over to China, it was Foxcom uh, that moved their factories over to China, and all of a sudden you could see, right, in, in her dissertation, all of a sudden it was between the, you know, kind of the little bubble that we live in. Right, because the Taiwanese engineers are dealing with Apple and Google and everything, and then all of a sudden they're moving their factories over to, to uh, China. It's a whole different, it's a whole different ball game, and you can see what's going on. So there, there are robot work done in all over Asia, I would ma imagine, and I know for a little bit from that work, and all over the rest of the world, that are not part of these kinds of conversations. I would think maybe they are part of these kinds of conversations. In fact, if somebody has some. Knowledge about that I would like to hear. So a, a historian always looks at time and place. So when I look at the present, I try to look at time and place too. I, like you, I don't try to look at the future that much. But um, I would, what I would say is, uh, yeah, it would be nice to have a system like that. I, I, I've admired France's system for a long time, which seems to be deteriorating, <laughs> losing a lot of its privileges, and Germany's too. But again, we're looking at just the U.S. and Europe and not the rest of the world. So um, this is what I'm trying to say is that this is how this debate should be uh, focused, not just from the, our individual perspectives. And even I have an individual perspective, even though I try to cover it all. Uh, not just one individual perspective. How that happens in a policy realm, I'm not quite sure how that can happen. It would be great if people have ideas about that. Um, and, uh, a question following up uh, something that Guy said uh, in the beginning you were um, doing this work and at some point uh, you were, I guess, forced to think about larger issues. Um, perhaps that's true for, for all of us. Um, but if we stay you know, outside of the realm of, of theory and academia uh, for once, and um, uh, what do we uh, as researchers, as academia, tell the Rust Belt worker who just get replaced by a robot, and what do we tell the migrant worker, um, you know, out as, as, a, as a kind of concrete thing to, to say? How, how do you address these issues? Perhaps a question outside of the realm of theorizing the, the problem itself. So I wonder if you've thought about uh, uh, a kind of response um, to that. So it's, kind of a, it's, kind of, it's a big question. In I can start if you want. I mean, I think what we tell them is that um, we've let them down <laughs> pretty seriously because right now we have very few policies to actually help them. We have very few policies to actually um, address technological displacement or um, structural unemployment, right, that's created in that kind of way. Uh, I think maybe the short term would be to find some way to harness technology-induced gains and then actually direct it into um, support and retraining for these people. But no, in the, in, the, in the super short run, I think we have nothing good to tell them at all. But then isn't that also where the social security net that is employed in many European countries? Is yes, <laughs> absolutely, yeah. I mean, workers in Europe or the US. Yeah, no, I was assuming they were here, yes. Um, no, yeah, you'd be much, if you do lose your job, you're much better off not being American. Um, if there's a, and not being here, if there's anything you can do. But I think, like, like I think both Ross and, and Guy also touched on, right, that part of what we do, um, I do it to a small extent, and I do it to a big extent, right, is we don't just work on better robots, we also work on systems that will help humans interpret robots, right? And so now I can be a layman user that works with a robot, and that means they could lose their job and the next day be the boss over a robot, you know, cohort. Um, so 
think as roboticists, most people actually work on sort of the dual sides, right? How do I make the robot better and how do I make it more accessible to the person who would command it? Could, could you describe your project a little bit better? We're in the, I have a joint appointment with electrical engineering, so we actually are in the same, we see each other a lot, but I don't know your project. Can you Nick, describe what you mean by robot collective? It's kind of interesting. Oh, uh, sure. So uh, the, the specific project I was just referring to was, um, if I have five robots uh, running around doing their thing and I designed them, but it's easy for me to tell if something went wrong with one of them. Uh, if I have 50 robots, it's much harder. And if I design them 50 robots and, and you have to control them, right, you're, you're completely stuck. There's no way you could, you could tell. Um, so, for example, right now I have one grad student finding a system that basically sits on your shoulder and watches the robots with you, talks to all the robots, mm -hmm. um, figures out, it makes a model of what the robot is doing. This is very vaguely, uh, makes a model and then compares all the robots and sees if anyone uh, does something that doesn't match with the rest, right? So if there are any outliers, it then shows this to the user on a screen and says, maybe direct your attention here, right? Try to try to try the battery, right? Like sort of decision support systems for a robot. So, I, I'd like to, um, so you asked a question that, that was, so you, asked, you asked a hard question. Everybody went quiet. <laughs> and the only person who didn't go quiet said, "I'm sorry." Um, and and I think I think this is I think this is uh, it's an experience that I personally increasingly have. Uh, it's and and it's um, that that we let you down. I think that's not a that's not a completely inv invalid uh, experience. And there's this uh, the sense that technology is just good for its own. It's just good because it's cool. Um, and at our education system, I, I studied computer science for you know two degrees and then. Um, nobody ever talked to me about society in computer science. Like society doesn't exist in computer science. Um, and y and if you think about if you start to think, think about it, you can't w walk into an Uber and not, you know, put your gaze down for a moment for having studied graph theory or finding fast routes between places. And these things we're, we're starting we're starting to meet them uh, over and over again. And, and interesting, I think, especially in the U.S., there's a very strange political situation. Here and I, I encountered this when I was on a flight, and next to me was somebody who Im implements robot robotics into factories, which is kind of like a, an odd coincidence. But uh, he has a small business that puts robots into bakeries and small businesses, and uh, and it was just after the elections. He was very happy. He was a Trump supporter, um, and he was talking to me about and and Trump went a lot on 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 all this job loss. This person also said that he was very happy that he's going to have to employ less immigrants now that he has, now that there's more robots. So that's like an interesting uh, du dual, like uh, what do you call it, like schizophrenia, uh, like a dual personality in the U.S. in terms of how people think about automation, manufacturing, and jobs, uh, and, and and like maybe to immigration. And, and th it was a very strange conversation on that plane ride, where we both said, you know, it's horrible that we're losing our manufacturing capabilities, but it's good that we don't have to employ, you know, immigrants, and um, and we are in we are in a political and social crisis right now, and. and I think this is, uh, you know, California obviously is feeling it more strongly than we do, um, but it's, it's, I don't think it's flooding the country and the world. So I thought I might amplify. I think Guy made a very good point just now. Um, we are often fed this narrative that immigrants and robots are both stealing our jobs, and how can that possibly be? Um, and it's worth asking a little bit what kind of jobs are getting displaced here. Right. So in robotics, uh, especially uh, in the last millennium, we used to talk about uh, the three Ds, dull, dirty, and dangerous jobs. And we'd say that those are the jobs that are candidates for automation. So you think about um, working in a coal mine or you think about um, you know, garbage processing, uh, working in a nuclear reactor. Um, for example, there was a, a robot in 1979 that went into Three Mile Island after the meltdown. Um, so these are the jobs that people pretty clearly didn't want. But there was another requirement, which is there, there had to be an element of, of cognitive simplicity. These robots were dumb. They still are dumb. Um, and, and I'll make a, a claim that even now, not a single uh, job that requires cognitive function above probably a cockroach ha has been d displaced by a robot. Um, the, I mean, 
you look at self-driving cars, right? There's not a single driver whose job has been lost to a self-driving car so far. That probably will change someday. But the kind of jobs, by and large, that have been lost to robots are really menial labor jobs and, and jobs that many people, given a, another alternative, would not want. Um, you could say, to some extent, the same is true of a lot of this immigrant labor. So picking crops, for example, um, these are jobs that Americans don't want because they pay very little, they're very hot, uh, you're in the sun, um, you're bent over all day, right? These are not pleasant jobs to have. And, but they're hard in a way that makes them not good candidates for automation. So how do you know when a crop is ripe? You, you look at it and you learn and you just know, but we don't have algorithms to describe that kind of thing. Um, and so actually by and large, the kind of jobs that immigrants and robots are replacing today are, are a little bit different in that the, the things that immigrants are doing require um, more cognitive capability than what robots still have, at least at this moment. We're in a very fast changing technological time, but um, that's what I see right now is that um, these are both different categories of jobs that people still don't want, Americans at least still don't want. My question is, okay, so if the job is our identity and we're worried about robots stealing our job, um, I feel like there's another part of our identity that we happily accepted technology taking over, right? So most people today have Alexa at home. Right? Alexa now does your grocery shopping, she does your research for you, she checks if the weather is okay, you know, she takes notes for you. Um, that used to be a huge part of your day um, and now it's sort of been compressed and people love it. And it's fantastic. So how are we so much more ready to accept Alexa than we would be to a, a robot that would potentially make your job a little bit lighter? So somebody else in the panel is probably better qualified to answer this, but I would say uh, w w if I'm a worker who has a high school education uh, trying to keep my job somewhere in the Midwest, uh, oh, there's, there's this, uh, making desk. There's an article in the New Yorker about this. Right? Making desk. That person have Le Alexa back at home? I don't. I don't know. I don't know. I think they do. <laughs> but if 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 they do, there's obviously if, if they do have the Alexa at home, it's obviously two different things, right, for them, right? So the Alexa is not building building the desk. So the fact that it's at home. I mean, I, I don't think it erases the problem for them, right? Because a robot at, in fact, at the app factory is making those desks, right? But Lex is not making, Lex is not taking your job. Lex is helping you do it better, right? And you're not worried about, and, and, and within the household, people should be worried about task and gender, access to task and you get does the task and so forth. But it's not a, it's not your livelihood. I think there's a, I, I can see that, but I think there's a disconnect, right? People have disconnects all the time about technology, right? And so, first of all, I would, so, uh, anyway, uh, I would be, uh, I think there's a gigantic difference between, like, a lecture and a factory robot. I want to answer. As far as it ain't. I want to answer Kirsten's question with another question, which is, this is targeted as a home application. And in the home, you're not replacing a job because this is stuff you did for free before. Um, so the question is, does there exist uh, an example of somebody who in a company had a secretary who did these things and, and bought an Alexa and, you, and fired the secretary or, or moved them to a different job and used the, the Alexa instead? I don't I know if anyone knows. I I'm not going to reveal who because I think my brother would be upset. But yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> Fascinating. So at, at at this point, we're gonna we're gonna open it up um, to include the audience. Um, I'm sure there are questions uh, for the panel. I'm really opening up all sorts of questions. Um, I too was thinking uh, with the title, "Will this robot take?" my job, I thought, will this robot take my son's job or will it take my daughter's job? 
And when you talk about the dirty Ds, I've never heard that expression, but what did I get? Dirty, dangerous, and disgusting? What was the dull. third one? What? Dull. Dull. Okay, good. Got it. Um, are those um, gendered jobs for the most part? I mean, have we done thought about like whose jobs are we taking? We've talked about the immigrants a little bit, but is there a kind of body? I mean, maybe there's the assembly line, but are those typically male jobs? Are we sort of relieving a whole generation of men without work? Certainly the trend that we've seen, right? The men have recovered much more poorly in the current economy than women have. Um, and yeah, the three Ds, I think, predominantly replaced men's work more than women's work. So in the men are going to be hanging out at home playing video games. <laughs> they can take care of the kids. But they have Alexa. They have Alexa. <laughs> I, I, I was almost going to say, well, well, if you look at the numbers, we it, in the U.S., it's white men who are not recovering with jobs. It's, it's very, very clearly uh, um, a small segment. But, uh, but I was going to say before we ended, how come we haven't talked about gender yet, mm -hmm. which is a really good point. And, and this ties into a larger societal thing is that a lot of times women's jobs are not jobs. They're just things that they happen to be doing for hours and hours, um, like in the home or child rearing. And these things don't have pay. They don't have benefits. They just magically happen because uh, they're not counted. And so in a, in a way, you could ask, uh, does the dis did the dishwasher take my job? Did the washing machine take my job? Um, and, and it's really interesting to look how these things are very gendered in terms of when you take a, a man's manufacturing job, that's a, that's a disaster. When you take a woman's like, chore in the, at the home, that's just technology getting better. And it's all, I think that's a really good point that you were making here. Um, so there's a, stu there's a study at Cornell about uh, automation in the home work and the number of hours worked in the home stayed the same like from 1920 to 1960, even though, even though the technology changed, but people worked as, as much time, right, that they got more done, right? So it, it, it's a different kinds of work too, right? There's no, I don't re recall any for, I don't recall much more leisure time in, in those either. Uh, it, it was the fact that they just used the time to get more done. It was done at, at the home, home ec Home economics department, or the home, now it's called the home e human ecology department. And I don't know if there's any up, up, updated uh, studies to those. Th these studies have been done in the 21st century about w w work in the home because men are doing a lot more work in the home. At least uh, I know my my son-in-laws, my sons are, but I don't know if there's any more studies about that. Um, yeah. So I I was curious. I think of a large. We're, we're on the precipice of, of something much larger in terms of technology that hasn't quite been addressed, which is AI, um, especially with Elon Musk's recent announcement about you know, being cautious of AI. And we, you know, you're, you're discussing like how humans still have agency. And that, that's one thing that separates us from the robots. But you know, that may change very soon. Um, so I'm curious what your thoughts are about AI, not just in terms of jobs, but perhaps also our, our own agency. In reality, I'm probably the last person here that should be talking about AI. <laughs> <laughs> I'll weigh in. Um, so it is true that certain types of algorithms, chiefly deep learning, have really transformed uh, certain capabilities. So uh, computer vision, for example. So Self-driving cars are much better at recognizing, at detecting pedestrians or detecting stop signs than they were. I mean, this is really the enabling technology that has made the Google car as successful as it has been, uh, allowed Uber to get as far as it has. Um, but these technologies are also limited. They don't give you a level of confidence, right? It can't say, I'm 95% certain that this is a pedestrian or there's a 5% chance this is a pedestrian that I'm about to run into, right? That, that's something you'd like to know. Um, so they don't come with that margin of error. And also, at least today, um, these deep learning algorithms are fairly restrictive in the, in the types of problems they're good at. They happen to be good at vision. Um, I think it's likely that in the next five to 10 years, they'll get good at this problem I mentioned of identifying when a crop is ripe. They're not quite there yet. Um, 
But there, there's really more to a job beyond these sort of pattern recognition problems that, that these AI algorithms are good at. Um, and it has to do with creativity. It has to do with problem solving. Um, and so to echo a point that Adam made earlier, I think that there's, there's really a nice synergy between what robots are going to do for us in the future and what we are going to do for them. Robots are good at repetition. They can work tire tirelessly day and night. Uh, but they're not good at solving problems. They're not good at one-off. They're not good at, um, at adaptation. And whereas humans thrive on those things. We are at our best when we're being creative, when we're troubleshooting, when we're helping out with some, some other um, agent, right? So I think that, that maybe I mean, going back to this optimistic scenario, what we're going to see is more of a duality where I and my AI or I and my robot together are going to solve much bigger problems than I could have solved alone or than, than the robot could have solved alone. So I, I often like to say that AI is both underestimated and overestimated at, at the current moment in time. Um, and I think it's overestimated because small achievements are being blown up in the media uh, to say much more general things than they actually say. And I can see uh, all the sad faces of my students here whose machine learning is not working on anything they try it out. And, um, and, I, and, I, and I think we need to be cautious, especially of Elon Musk and the like of their predictions uh, of how much AI is actually going to, to achieve. But also, I think people don't understand how many <laughs> things we consider to be very complicated are actually not as complicated as we thought. And I specifically believe medical diagnostics is going to undergo a huge change um, with AI. That, uh, um, so in some cases, I think we, it, it, it's good at very specific things, uh, as you said. Well, I mean, I can't, I can't speak to the, I cannot speak to the, of, of AI, but I think it's a pretty interesting question because if it, if if a machine or a robot were to become conscious, we might end up uh, with the question whether he, she, or it might even want the job, um, which is kind <laughs> of an, might might be an interesting problem down down the road. that is the case, then something is radically different, right? And with the technology. Because usually the, usually the panaceas, uh, sometimes they involve technology and sometimes they involve politics. The radical ones, like that first slide, replacing money with a, with a system based on Earth's amount of energy it takes you to do it, you know, it requires a completely different political economic system. That's a radical change. If these changes, the latter change that you just talked about with AI, are there, then it is radically different than in the past. And, and uh, I still think you should include the other ones, but then you, then you have to really pay more, much more attention. Uh, and then pe when people say, well, it's the technology that's driving everything, then, then you might have a point. <laughs> right? Then you might have a point. Um, so I just, um I wanted to get your, the panel's opinion on this, but I feel like um, a lot of these discussions sort of have an implicit assumption that might not be accurate anymore, where um, they assume that the capabilities of humans are relatively flat. Um, but now with sort of the rise of cybernetics, that might not be true anymore, where um, robots are usually replacing humans because they're better at these things, but through cybernetics, like the world's fastest runner may soon not have human legs. Um, so I'd like to see your how that might be able to level the playing field and sort of allow humans and robots to collaborate to a much greater extent and even within the span of just one human body themselves. Well, this is a development that's actually already happening in, for example, construction technology. There are companies in, in Korea that have developed a kind of exoskeleton suit that allows you to you know, carry big steel beams um, you could otherwise not, not carry. Um, so where where this would end, I, I don't know. I, I can only I can only speculate. Uh, but it's a, it's a pretty interesting uh, question um, in, in general. At the, at the moment, this is science fiction. 
which means inevitably it gets us thinking more about the ethics than maybe some of the pragmatic aspects. So for example, if there was a job that required you to have some superhuman ability, maybe a microchip Im implanted in your brain, well, it's not obvious that I want a microchip implanted in my brain. There may be downsides to that, but if there's an incentive, namely uh, getting income, to, to have that thing implanted in me, then maybe I'm gonna do it even if it's working against my own best interest. So um, there's a lot of interesting questions that are raised by that. I'm sorry, I don't have any of the answers, but great question. Do you think in this discussion though, it's important that we, 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 we are very clear on the distinctions between a machine right, that has sort of a one workspace and a mechanism and AI, which is a clever robot, which could decide whether or not it wants this job, right? I mean, we could still design simpler robots that, that, that just basically go at it without any higher form of intelligence, and that is certainly the bulk of robots out there today. I just, we're talking about all of these things at once, but, but they're very different sets of problems. I, I had a question about, um, really about who, who this question or the, the premise of this discussion addresses, or that is, whose job is it taking? <laughs> And I think the, the question really addresses uh, only rich people, or that is maybe even only white people, or the global West. Um, and that the jobs that we're discussing being lost are really those um, which exist only in, in industrialized or countries that until now have been heavily industrialized, industrially based. Um, you know, we're talking about industrial jobs like manufacturing cars or whatever. Um, and I'd like to ask, uh, how do how do uh, how does this question of, of robotics and robotics taking jobs address people in the developing world or in countries where jobs are not so technological or not so apt to being taken by robotics? So, uh, so one place where this comes up is in the reshoring of work, particularly in the political climate that we operate in now in the U.S. You know, companies are under a lot of pressure to bring work back to the U.S. This was a big deal in the, in the recent presidential election. Uh, and companies now are bringing work back to the US, or at least they're bringing production back to the US. But of course, when they do that, uh, they're not really creating any jobs, right? They're just automating work that was actually done by human beings um, in Asia and in, in, um, in, you know, in developing countries around the world. So I mean, I actually think these issues do impact, impact developing countries workers in developing countries. Um, it's just that where wages are as low as they are there, um, the impact has been delayed a bit. But this will impact them as well, certainly. Well, I appreciate the, the question quite a bit because I was, uh, it was raised earlier and it kind of got dropped. One way to answer this, of course, the question is, is there this kind of debate that the way this panel is framed in other parts of the world, right? That part of the debate now, or has, has there ever been that part of the debate in the past? Because I have a feeling you're right, it is a Western debate. And it's been a Western debate since at least Frederick Engels and probably before that. So there, it is a Western debate. So there, this will be interesting to see if, if there are all these concerns in China or there are these concerns in Japan or Taiwan, or any part of Asia, any part of Africa, uh, how, how they deal with it, how they deal with this debate. I think it would be instructive, right? I would love to be able to have somebody come in my classroom, right, and give that perspective from that part of the world that well, we don't even think about this, and this is why we don't think about it. It would be terrific. I mean, Terry Gow at Foxconn is, is very serious about automating as much of that work as possible. And he's, and he's begun to do that. Since uh, the panel is um, somewhat homogenous, <laughs> maybe the audience has some more information than yeah. we do. Yeah. Um, Throw it back to the audience. Uh, anybody wants to comment on that question? Um, may I uh, join with a comment and perhaps a question? Um, so, just to go back to this division of labor, perhaps men, women, uh, work, home, etc. Uh, first of all, it's interesting to look at the etymology of robot. It comes from robota in Czech, which is work for somebody else like on the field, you know, in feudalism, uh, whereas Pratze was work for yourself at home. Uh, and so 
uh, etymologically, the name is already imbued, I think, with um, um, this um, external uh, exchange. Um, and I think, you know, since we're in critically now, um, I would like to be slightly critical of um, this um, um, setup where it's okay if the robot takes jobs or not, no matter what. Uh, I, I appreciate the comments uh, mentioned uh, and uh, how, you know, we have to work as a society. Uh, because the question is this one. Um, whom does the robot uh, um, beneficiate? What, what is the benefit? And um, I think it's interesting to uh, look at it um, as a problem of increasing um, uh, uh, division, um, of, of increasing uh, economical disparity, where um, more and more robots benefit less and less people uh, and um, uh, kind of leave other works more tenial, you know, scheduled um, more randomly. And um, so the question is, you know, how to deal with that? Because, of course, a lot of cultures were built on surplus value, uh, you know, slavery, feudalism, um, capitalism. So is this now uh, robotism? And how do we deal with the society, uh, as a society, um, with, with this um, increasing um, um, inequality that the robots might, might bring? And of course, you know, we have outdated um, labor laws and um, kind of um, 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 socialist, social um, means to protect labor, but there are ideas, and maybe you have ideas uh, uh, concerning that, uh, about how to decrease this inequality where, you know, there's also ideas of uh, taxing robots as workers are taxed, of course. Uh, why wouldn't we, uh, if we tax other workers uh, or, or car factory workers, why couldn't we tax the robots? Um, you know, there's um, um, value-added tax, there's taxes on CDs because of um, piracy problems. So why would you add a tax on, um, um, you know, the social net that the robot contributes to, etc. So, I mean, these are perhaps some questions um, about how the society can, um, you know, address this increasing inequality that the robots may uh, create. So I, I think you're asking a bunch of really interesting questions. Um, from a pragmatic standpoint, there, there are people that are kicking this idea around, there are institutional economists that are kicking this idea around that um, workers should be encouraged to own the robots. Basically, uh, in the US, uh, macroeconomically, the labor share of income has been falling uh, consistently now for years, <laughs> for, for a long time. Um, income, in, if you think about GDP, has been shifting from labor to capital. And so the idea is that one way to mitigate the uh, inequality consequences of technological change could be to actually encourage workers to essentially own shares of the companies that make robots. It's not, it's not crazy, um, but I don't think it's the cure-all that some of the people that are suggesting it um, think it, it might be. The robot tax is really interesting because uh, some really respected people, I guess Bill Gates in particular, have made the case that we should be taxing robots. And um, it is true that the, essentially the work that workers, that labor does, is essentially taxed, whereas the work that capital or that technology or robots do isn't taxed, and that is kind of a perverse incentive system. The problem, though, is um, how do you decide what to tax and what not to tax? I mean, so we would, we would tax robots, so does that mean we would, attack, we, we would tax um, sort of anthropomorphic looking machines that look like this? Like, what about word processors? Should we be taxing those? I mean, I think they've probably cost us a lot of jobs over the years, and so it's difficult to decide where to draw the line. And in fact, I don't know that it makes a lot of sense to target specific technologies. I think really what we should be doing is, if we're gonna think about this from a policy perspective, we should be trying to figure out ways to grow the pie as big as possible, um, to incentivize technological advancement and technological development. 
rather than to slow it down at all, right, or to create any kind of perverse incentives that shift, that, um, that shift capital around in inefficient ways. Our goal should be to make the pie really big and then to think about the policies that we need to actually divide it in a way that we think is fair and equitable. Um, so again, I think it's great that people are thinking creatively um, and that people really want to try these things and see what works. And in that sense, I, 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 uh, I'm sort of a fan of the robot tax, but I can already see sort of what its problems are and would be. Um, and in general, I, I do think that we should be trying to promote technological advance as best we can, rather than to sort of slow it down while we try to figure things out. So what you said about uh, Thank you, Alexa. Uh, <laughs> what, <laughs> what you said about a new form of capitalism is interesting. So 20 years ago, you may know that Manuel Castells uh, thought we were in and, and wrote huge books and a pretty strong argument that we're in a new, new form of capitalism, and he called it informational capitalism. This is before this period with concern of robots. So I think actually someone should look into the fact if you want to think we're in a new form of capitalism. And if we, and if we are, then that should be the framework for the conversation. And because the informational cap capitalism he talked about was a network kind of society, network kind of uh, economies that were all spread all over the globe. And so if this is a new form, that to me would do a lot to have a better debate. Because we're debating it in terms of an older political economy, right? We, theories of political economy. Right, so here's a different, strange form of lag. It's the theory that's lagging, <laughs> you know, b behind. So I, that, that's an interesting idea. It's a really interesting. Idea. I have a suggestion, maybe in lieu of the robot tax, which is a little hard to define the semantics. Um, we can look at product labeling. So products tell where they come from. Do they come from China? Are they made in the USA? People might be willing to pay more for a product made in the USA. Likewise. If a product were labeled made with human labor, <laughs> made without robots, right? I think people might be willing to pay more for that. Handmade. Handmade. That's right, handmade. We're, we're running out of time. I think maybe we have uh, more, more questions. Or, or. All right. Um, my name is Edward. Uh, thank you for talking to us today, all of you. Um, and for the open conversation. Um, I would have really liked this, uh, this conversation to start with a more in deep um, question of what technology means, right? Um, because I, in my case, I am, I am I'm not so interested in, I guess, in, in, I'm not so interested in what is bad about technology or, or if it will take my job. I'm more interested in the um, conceptions sustained with it and through it, right? The social conceptions and how our societies are actually being influenced by this idea of technology, right? So then um, I would actually like to pick up right into this idea of the technology, this thing, right, uh, associated with the machine and this thing as a mechanic, a very good at producing, mass producing stuff or doing uh, repeating operations, and then the human being as a sort of thing that has this other capacity of being creative and making interconnections and making metaphors and writing poems, right? Um, so it turns out actually that uh, it seems like the material values of the creative disciplines are not more valued with this very techno-scientific, now very society that really values technology a lot. It's actually hindered, right? So for example, in my country, in Puerto Rico, I, I had the chance to study this subject and it turns out that with neoliberalism, which is a very techno-scientific centered right, ideology in which progress is associated with updating everything, right, computer information, et cetera, et cetera, um, it turns out that the works of uh, artists, particularly sculptors and painters, is actually more precarious. So they can't plan in long terms. Um, they have, uh, they, so some of them work in very precarious infrastructures. Um, so, uh, and, and this is obviously associated with inequality, and it seems like technology is associated, is definitely, can definitely be a weapon, a weapon for power, and it, and it actually fires unevenly. So, I, I would like to see if you can actually tell me what's the agenda behind technology, right? Um, how do we see this thing playing out in the geopolitical scene? Um, and, uh, yes, and, and sort of how it is, where it is directed, apart from that, 
utopian idea of technology as the thing that will liberate us in the future. Tom, do you want? Yeah, so that, that was very good. Uh, in science and technology studies, uh, historians, philosophers, and sociologists, maybe, maybe you've read some of our work, uh, we've dealt with this issue quite a bit. And then thanks for bringing it up, because sometimes I, I think uh, people know this. <laughs> and I guess, so thanks for bringing this up. So that's, a, that's the best question, right? You know, do we think of, well, how do we, how do we consider technology as part of culture, culture that's been brought up, or is, would you, do we consider it as part of an oppressive thing that's used by everyone else? So it's not neutral. There's no way that, tech, that technology is neutral. So that's an extremely, uh, it's a extremely good uh, question. And I think it should be part of the debate. When I said uh, we should think it's a technological unemployment debate, the questioning of what technology is and what people want to do with it should be part of that debate. Too. Well, as, as is the, the global scale that, that you brought up, uh, Ron, um, or also the issue of diversity, even within, within the panel, which has been pointed out as kind of a homogenous um, entity in, in some, some sorts, well, that's kind of what's available at the, at the university. That's something uh, that uh, we, can, we can all contemplate about. Um, to add a little bit to your question, Edward, um, not really answering it, but just saying or pointing out a, a certain shift in understanding of uh, what the benefits or dangers of technology are, we are currently having the debate about know Google and Facebook and the don't be evil versus the kind of political machinery so something that was understood a couple of years ago as as liberating and connecting people is suddenly this kind of dark alter network uh, that, that produces alter alternate facts and, and other types of realities that people indulge in so there's there are always two sides to, to each of these um, uh, promises and premises of technology, which one has to uh, keep in mind, I would say. So I, th I think we have... There's one more comment. I, I'm curious to see. So yeah. you, you raised your hand right? uh, to answer Guy's question. I'd be curious to hear that. Basically an extension of the conversation about um, would robots affect, say, developing country or actually developed country like China now. I'm not an expert in this, but um, you know, uh, I think it definitely, uh, it's similar to what Ra um, Adam was saying, that it definitely has affect the workers there in China. Um, you know, you have, um, for example, the Chinese version of Amazon. They have entirely um, systematized and automated their um, packaging and delivery service, right? Whereas Amazon, you still have people standing around and picking up goods and, you know, with, um, uh, conveyor belts and so on. Um, it's basically a series of thousands of little Roomba robots that's actually moving goods around. So they already entirely eliminated the labor in that process. Um, and then regarding the industrial um, sector's labor market that has also shifted, um, you know, for example, jobs for Foxconn or other manufacturing factories, the workers are actually increasingly have become more transient, meaning that factory job rather than manufacturing job seeing as something stable and that they see as a long-term um, job, which has been how it was in the past decades, um, the cheap labor and so on, um, that has also shifted that people are less willing to um, you know, go through the long hours and then go through the stringent schedule, um, the minimum breaks and so on. So younger generation has been actually moving from jobs from factories to factories a lot more often than say what, what, how it was in the past like eight years. So, um, so I think in that sense, maybe they're going through what the US had gone through, you know, like decade or two decades ago, so. Thanks very much. Thank you. All right. So I want to I want to thank the panel. I think this is a discussion that could be ongoing forever, more or less, probably without any conclusion. <laughs> um, and uh, but I think it's an important topic. I'm very glad uh, that you guys could all make it and that we had this wonderful discussion here. And I want to thank the audience also for for participating. And uh, a round of applause for for you guys for taking the time to come here. Thank you.